there have been seismic development in global politics, with some countries wanting to maintain the world order, but others so keen to change and reshape the world. Good evening. I'm Gatri Minyuki, and welcome to Vantage. Tonight, on the program Vantage, we've got a special guest all the way from London, and he is none other than renowned professor of world politics, Professor Stephen Chan from the School of Oriental and African Studies, a part of the University of London. Prof, welcome to the program Vantage. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to be here. You have come at the right time, Professor, insofar as Zimbabweans are concerned. Um, last week, uh, British Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson resigned. And the Zimbabweans, they had an interest in that because they had hoped that when the new dispensation in Zimbabwe took over, there were going to be significant improvements in the relations with London. But alas, it did not happen. How does the resignation of Bojo affect the relationships between Zimbabwe and the United Kingdom? I don't think anything is going to change because all of the people who are contenders to replace Boris Johnson all have the same attitude towards Zimbabwe. Partly this is because they're ig ignorant of what's happening in this part of Africa. Partly because Zimbabwe is just not important enough to rise up the agenda. We've got our own much, much larger problems now in Europe itself and in our relationships with China. So no change. Underneath the previous Conservative government, underneath Theresa May, but when Boris Johnson was Foreign Secretary, Rory Stewart was the Minister of Africa, and it was I who advised Mr. Stewart to come for the inauguration of President Menengagwa. I was in his office, and in fact, I wrote the speech for him to deliver when he got here, which said that we'll re-engage if certain conditions, chiefly to do with human rights and electoral reform, have been met. And those conditions have not been met. Now, in fact, they were also exactly the same conditions laid down by the Commonwealth for readmission to the Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth also has been disappointed, which is why you were not admitted back into that organization at the Kigali summit. So I'm projecting no change unless there is change here first. And I don't see at this moment in time any signs of any real serious change in this country when it comes to electoral reform. Those who are close to the government, that is Mr. Mnangagwa's government, contend that it was really unfair for the world to expect a worst of changes from the ZANPF government without also expecting that same world to remove the shackles that they've been always placed on the ZANPF government right going back to the time of the late former president Robert Mugabe. Do you agree that the shekels which they talk about here, the sanctions, have had an impact on the way how things are supposed to be going between Harare, UK, and possibly Washington and the rest of Western Europe? Well, in fact, the sanctions imposed by Washington are much, much stronger than those imposed by Europe and the UK. So your real quarrel in terms of sanctions is with Washington, D.C., the sanctions that remain now from Europe and the UK are modest, particularly when you look at the seriousness of the sanctions that people are applying to Russia because of the war in Ukraine. Now, sanctions are being used as an excuse here. The real disincentive about this country becoming more engaged with global politics and global trade and the global economy is because when firms and corporations are looking for possibilities of investment in this country, they don't see a productive operating environment. There's not enough infrastructure. There's no guarantee of protection from corruption. So if I were a corporation wanting to look at this country, I would ask some certain key questions. What guarantees do I have of an operating climate that is going to allow me to operate freely? 
What guarantees do I have about repatriation of profit? What guarantees do I have that I don't have to pay off somebody in a corrupt way in order to be free to operate? Those are much more important questions and much more fundamental questions than any excuse to do with corruption. Yeah, you talk about those being the most fundamental questions. In your view, what has stagnated, what had at first appeared to be, you know, a, a desire and well-intentioned move by the new dispensation of uh, Mr. Munangagba to tackle decisively this corruption issue you're talking about. But nothing has happened. Corruption still continues. Of course, it's not been really curtailed in any meaningful way. And the way that the economy is structured now, for instance, particularly with two currencies effectively, uh, the local currency and the US dollar, there's much manipulation of the exchange rate, which allows people to benefit just from the fact that there are two currencies. Poor people can't speculate on the exchange rate. Rich people can. And so there's no thought about catering for the expectations and the planning horizons of poor people, while rich people can benefit from the exchange rates. That itself is a form of corruption. So there's everyday corruption which benefits only a small percentage of the population. Whereas on this visit, I've been out to the high density areas. I've been to Chitanguiza, I've been to Mbare, I've been to Epworth, I've been to Rua. I see people suffer. They're not benefiting. And as long as people are suffering, they're also looking at the government and the way that they see the government as facilitating corruption. What impacts do you think this suffering will have on the upcoming 2023 national elections? I've been saying quite openly that it's not a case of the possibility of Chamisa and the CCC winning the 2023 elections. I see this as a possibility of ZANU PF losing the 2023 elections because people who would normally have supported them will desert them because their living standards have dropped right down through the floor. And if the ruling party is not careful, it will lose its own support base. When you talk of losing its support base, do you think that between now and 2023 elections, the ruling government has got the will with all to address some of these outstanding issues, particularly the issue of suffering that you're actually referring to? I don't think it has the will. I'm not even sure they recognize just how bad things are for ordinary people. Just in the week or two I've been here, I came into this country and the inflation rate was officially meant to be 191%. That's still the highest in the world. Today, it's probably more realistically estimated at 400% inflation. Now, if the inflation rate keeps getting higher and higher, prices keep getting higher and higher, the availability of goods like petrol, like flour for wheat and from wheat for bread and things like that. If all of that keeps continuing, how is the ordinary person meant to live? So I see that inflation will keep rising. It won't be as high as 2007, 2008, but I see it eventually reaching many hundreds of percent. That's a grim picture you're painting mm -hmm. there. We'll be back. Please don't go away. We're just taking a short break. This is Vantage. Welcome back. Before we went for the break, Professor, we're talking about uh, the economy and the worsening environment uh, to which you said could impact negatively and disastrously for the ruling zanu -PF. I would like to take you to the upcoming zanu -PF Congress where they're supposed to elect uh, leaders. Uh, do you think there are going to be changes, both that would see an improvement in the economy and also changes in the way the, cap the party is being governed and taking a certain direction? No, I think that what you're going to have with the Congress is a very carefully camouflaged, cosmetic covering up of the big differences within the party. There's very clearly a power struggle behind the scenes, not even very far behind the scenes in the party. 
many jealousies, many contentions to rise to positions of power. So people are much more worried about power distribution in the party rather than policies for the future of the country. And the one thing that one would look for is not so much to do with will President Minagawa survive as president of the country and president of the party. One would normally look for will there be a generational change in the party leadership? Will young technocratic people who are members of the party and by that I mean people in their 30s and their 40s, not part of the liberation generation, not people living in history, but people looking to the future, will they get a chance to rise to the top positions in the party? And I guarantee they will not have such a chance. But this means that whoever wins the power struggles within the party, these will be of the generation looking to the past. And of course, there was a heroic past. The liberation struggle was genuinely heroic. I supported myself the liberation struggle and tried very hard myself to help it. But we're not living back then. We're living forward. And there is no planning, there's no vision for the future that these young people will inherit. The party will reveal that it's serious about the future by electing a whole group of young political leaders in the Congress. But I don't think that's going to happen. Talking about forward-looking, renewal, and having young people assuming God, the opposition has got uh, Nelson Chamisa, who is leading the Triple C with much of the younger generation. Do you think he's got what it takes to be able to be the alternative? It's not just a case of Jamisa, whether or not he might be a good president or not a good president. Obviously, people speculate about that endlessly. It's a case of what kind of government he's going to lead. One person can't run an entire country. But I know the question that I'm going to be asked by the Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office as soon as I get back to London. My phone will ring and they will ask me, Stephen, did you find out who is going to be their Minister of Finance? Who's going to be their Minister of Justice, Education, Health, etc., etc.? What kind of government are we going to be dealing with should the young man win? And I'm going to have to say I haven't got a clue who's going to be holding these important ministerial portfolios because Chamisa has not announced what his front bench is like. We've got no clue with whom we're going to liaise with, with whom we might wish to cooperate with. So the question in my mind is not just around Chamisa. My mind is very much centered on what kind of government is he going to lead, and he's not letting us know what kind of government it is that he wishes to lead. Without that knowledge, the world is not going to trust him to be a good leader just by himself. In your view, you're quite well versed with politics and you have studied politics across all the continents. Why would someone like, like uh, Mr. Chamisa dither on having a front team and announcing people begging him? You're going to have to ask Mr. Chamisa that. I think maybe he's not as fully secure in this position as he would like to be. He doesn't want to promote people to a position of visibility so that he might be challenged. So I think that's a mistake. I think he's got to learn to trust people, work with people, give responsibility to people, because in government that's what he's got to do. In other words, it seems to me, and I've said this often before in the past, but I do mean it. I myself was a student politician. I was the national student president in New Zealand. And he was a student president here at University of Zimbabwe. He's still behaving like a student president, but that's not the way a president of a country behaves. A president of a country has got to deal with staff. He's got to deal with many ministers of many, many ministries. He's got to deal with complex institutions. And he's got to realize he has to have people who know how to deal with these things. He's not dealing with one little student union. So leadership means being able to recognize that and to devolve responsibility to people who can help him run the country. The country is complex. He needs experts in every single field with which the country is involved. So 
How important is Mr. Chamisa's changing the current picture that he has painted, which is almost like a, 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 a political student? How important is it to the outside world which might sympathize with him? The outside world wants to see the front bench. As I said, I guarantee I get a phone call the day after I get back to London saying, Stephen, do you know what the front bench is? If I talk to my friends in the State Department in Washington, D.C., and they know I'm visiting here, I'll say, Stephen, what is the front bench? What is the shape of the government? If we're going to give a lot of aid to, say, education and health after he's elected, who is going to be the Minister of Education? Who is going to be the Minister of Health? Is that someone we can work with? Can we trust that person? And if I say, I don't know who that person is going to be, then I know what they're going to say is, well, look, we can't start planning these things until we know who these people are going to be, what the shape of the ministry is going to be like, what health policy is going to be like, what educational policy is going to be like, what financial policy is going to be like. One of the things that disappoints me is, and you know that I've been a critic of the finance minister, Mutuli, I think his financial strategy is wrong, but it's in some ways an orthodox financial strategy straight out of the economics textbooks. I can't say he made up something silly, it's just that the textbook doesn't apply to Zimbabwe. But what I want to know is what is the CCC alternative financial strategy? I want to know what the financial plan is should they become the government in this country. I have seen nothing that resembles a detailed alternative, detailed alternative financial plan. A definitive roadmap and a clear strategy with a very visible team in front. Please don't go away. We are here. We've got a definitive way of ending this program. We're taking a short break when we return we'll be going to the last segment of Vantage. Please don't go away. Welcome back to the final segment of this week's Vantage. If you've just joined us, we have a special guest on this week's program, uh, Professor Stephen Chan, who is the Professor of World Politics from the School of Oriental and African Studies a part of the University of London. Professor Chan, we were talking about uh, the gaps and uh, seemingly uh, indecisiveness on the part of uh, Mr. Chamisa. I'm sure you are well versed with Zimbabwean politics revolving around personalities. The politics of personalities, when you talk about Mr. Chamisa not having all these things, there are Zimbabweans who say that he's popular, we love him. And you talk of uh, personalities, there are people who say, Mr. Minangagwa, we love him, yes. Mm -hmm. He's uh, taking his time to deal with corruption, but we love him. So, given what you've just said, how important is it to the electorate? Look, you can't run a country on love. I would love it <laughs> if you could run a country <laughs> on love, but you really can't. The Zimbabwe, for all of its problems, is a very complex country. That's why we think there's still a future for the country because there's all kinds of diversity, all kinds of talents, all kinds of things that you can develop for the future. And because there's so many things that you must think about, no, it can't just be done on love and trust and faith. It's got to be done on expertise. If you look up north at what's happening in Zambia, for instance, with the new government, Mr. Hichilema has assembled a technocratic government They've got a plan. It might not be a successful plan because their problems are very, very complex. Their debt restructuring is a big, big issue and it's requiring many months of delicate negotiations. But he's got people who know how to do these negotiations. Now, if you say it's just love and faith and hope and trust, look, this country is in debt as well. I don't trust your official figures. I think you're in debt much more than what you're saying in public. How are you going to deal and negotiate with the IMF? How are you going to deal and negotiate even with the Chinese? Even your neighbor, South Africa, you owe a lot of money to South Africa. You owe money to the African Development Bank. You owe money everywhere. 
that's not going to be repaid by love, faith, hope and trust. These are real world problems that require experts at negotiation and requires a willingness to make sacrifices to start, start repaying people. Because right now in the world economic downturn, everybody's having economic problems. They're not going to keep giving you money forever and certainly not keep giving you money for nothing. So there comes a payback time and that requires expertise. That requires a very, very great deal of knowledge. It re requires a very great deal of skill. So the future of this country depends on how skillful the leadership is, how skillful the government is, not whether they're loved or not. Thank you. Zanu PF, you see there's old guard. The opposition, you see Chamisa representing the the new, young and the new. But the country is in a very difficult uh, position and also in a state of flux. Would you say then, those who are calling for dialogue, say let's have postponement of elections for now and uh, find each other first before we can decide about contesting, do you think that can have currency? It's an interesting idea, form some kind of government of unity get to work together, have elections later on when the country is stabilized. But I don't think there's the willingness to do that on either side. Everyone is pinning their hopes and gaining a victory at the forthcoming elections, hoping that the Zimbabwean people will vote for them. And in fact, the people should have a choice. It's their country at the end of the day. It's nobody else's country. The country doesn't belong to a political elite. So the people should choose so I don't see a government of national unity being negotiated into place. And one of the reasons why I don't see that happening in any case is you can't even get the two men into the same room together to have a dialogue. Now, again, I notice what's happened in Zambia. After President, the former President Rupia Banda died, there was a church service. I was given a copy of the program. There was a special place for former President Lungu. He was treated with great dignity. A place, of course, for the current president, Hichilema. He was treated with dignity. The two men shook hands. They wished each other well in public, in front of the cameras. They slapped each other on the back. They made jokes. And they behaved like civilized human beings. Can you imagine that happening in this country between the president and the leader of the opposition? That's never happened. It's not going to happen. They can't even agree on a moment of dialogue. Do you think under those conditions they can agree a government of national unity without an election? It's not going to happen. Why shouldn't it happen? If it could happen under these reasonably negotiated conditions, then perhaps there's some currency in the idea. I just don't see the two men as capable of cooperating in that manner. Sure. So, Professor, we have studied the history of Zimbabwe. You know it extensively. What is likely to happen in 2023 elections? Because you allude to the fact that people must be given the opportunity to decide. So how are they likely to decide, given all that we have discussed on this program? I think that what might feature in the next elections is a very large abstention vote. People won't vote because they're so disillusioned with what's happening. And I think that in terms of looking to the future, many people will rather have the devil they know rather than the devil they don't know. So I think it's highly likely that the government will squeak back in. However, there could be a divided vote. You could have the very, very unusual and difficult situation where, for instance, Mr. Chamisa wins the presidency, but Zalu PF wins parliament. So then that's what the French call the need for a government of cohabitation. They have got to learn to work together. You might get some form of national unity government then. The problem then for Chamisa is that the ZANU-PF party will still control the security forces. And so they'll be able to a large extent to dictate the terms and conditions of any Chamisa presidency. Because although Chamisa might be popular, because the party, the CCC, is not yet well organized. It may well be that there's a divided result in the elections and you might have that kind of scenario. One person wins the presidency but doesn't win the parliament. 
But overall, I think the chances right now are that the ZANU-PF and Minangagwa will win the next elections. Mm -hmm. um, I'll refer you to a recent survey by the Africa Barometer, which was released in, which was released in two parts. The first part said uh, the popularity, in terms of popularity in the eyes of the ele electorate. Mr. Mnangagba was leading by a percentage point. And then uh, we also heard it saying if your elections were to be held today, Mr. Chamisa would win. Uh, but at the same time, Zanupia would actually control eight provinces out of ten provinces. Mm -hmm. So does this speak to a possible scenario that you're talking about? That kind of scenario, variations on the scenario I painted are very, very possible. But right now, if you look at any opinion poll, the highest lead that Chamisa has is only 2%. And that's not enough. Again, when you look at Zambia and the victory of Hichilama, he won by 10%, which meant that people had to accept that victory. 2%, 1% could be contested. There were all kinds of cries of rigging, etc., etc., etc. So if he's not leading at this stage of the proceedings by a much larger margin than 2%, he should be, given the reluctance of people to believe in the government because of the poor economic performance, he should be in his best of all possible worlds leading by between 6 and 10%. If he hasn't got that kind of lead now, what's the strategy to build that kind of lead for the 2023 elections? How is he going to peak at the kind of lead he needs? I don't think they've actually got an electoral strategy in the sense that is required. And one of the things that I noticed, and I used to criticize, I mean, the late Chang Rai and I were good friends, and I used to criticize him to his face. And I would say, look, where is your registration drive? All these people in the red t-shirts, all these young people screaming your name at your rallies, they love you. They're not registered to vote. I could probably ask the same question of Mr. Chamisa. All these young people in yellow t-shirts at his rallies, cheering and waving, they're not registered. Where's your registration drive? In no election featuring the MDC or the CCC have I ever seen a registration drive this is fundamental, for instance, in American politics. It's why Biden won the elections against the machine of Donald Trump. He had a registration drive. He got his voters registered. There's no recognition, there's no plans for a registration drive here on behalf of the alternative government that Mr. Chamisa wishes to put into power. We haven't got enough of you yet, uh, Professor Chad. But uh, we'll end it here for now. Uh, I would like to thank you for having made time uh, to be on Vantage. There you are, uh, viewers. I'll sign off with what uh, the Bible says in Isaiah. Your thoughts are not my thoughts, nor your ways my ways. For the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways. 2023 is for you to decide. I'm Gatrim Manyuki. Good night. <laughs>